Um, hello everyone, um, my name is Antonio Roberts, this is Lucy Hutchinson, she will introduce herself, but yeah. And um, yeah, so we're going to be talking about the collaborative work that we've been doing called, uh, which we've recently started calling Evasive Maneuvers. Um, first, I think I'll just introduce myself um, and what I do. So I'm an artist and curator here based in Birmingham, and I think since last year, um, I've been interested a lot more in surveillance culture. Um, pretty much starting for me with this exhibition which was at Vivid Projects called Stealth, uh, which, yeah, uh, took the work of six national and international artists, each of whom were kind of in their own ways, uh, like this is a piece by James Bridle, um, talking about how surveillance in whatever form it might be, be it software, hardware, um, done by governments or by individuals, uh, is such a big part of our society. and. From that, uh, began to work with Lucy to create similar uh, pieces of artwork which have built upon that, and I think this is where I'm going to hand over to you. Um, so, my name's Lucy Hutchinson, and I'm an artist, and I mainly work in printmaking and photography, and I'm based in Birmingham. And we're going to just talk about two projects which we're working on. The first of which is a digital protest mask, and we've been working on that for the past year, and we're hoping to finalise that during the fellowship. And then the second is going to cover our research into the media eyes at Birmingham New Street Station, which we've just started looking at recently. So I'm just going to go a bit through the, the history of the protest mask and where, where we're at now with that and where we're going with it. So. We did a um, feminist residency at Strix, which is a gallery in Minerva Works in Digbeth. And um, at the time, we were looking at the move of political campaigns online and the real lack of direct action and presence within public spaces. And we, were, we focused on a particular campaign called This Is What a Feminist Looks Like, which was put forward by the Fawcett Society and had various politicians and celebrities brandishing the slogan on various t-shirts like Ed Miliband and uh, Nick Clegg. Um, and it was a, a really well circulated campaign but there was um, a real lack of public support, public support um, and a real reluctance especially from women outside the artistic community to refer to themselves as feminists and in just generally a real lack of empathy with attaching oneself to particular political ideologies. So we put forward a number of conditions which followed a number of researchers' thoughts on participation and resistance and associated these with the original campaign. Uh, so we started looking at Adam, Adam Harvey's work, whose this is, and um, he's an artist based in New York, and he has put forward these kind of face paints, which are dazzle face paints, which basically stop the faces from being recognised by computers. And these have basically been developed from World War One dazzle ships, which were, so, during World War One, many of the ships and also the planes as well were painted with these patterns to basically make them untargetable and safe. Yeah, some uh, dazzle swimwear. It came quite a fashion statement as well. So this was the installation at Strix, and we set up a kind of um, photo booth, which had a background and then a laptop on a plinth. And users were invited to come and take photographs of themselves wearing this interactive dazzle mask. That's so, so basically there was there was a list of instructions and then someone had to press a button. And we had about maybe about a hundred people, I think, did it on the evening. It was during the first Friday event. And they all got shared online and they got hashtagged with the same slogan, which kind of hijacked the uh, the original campaign. So the original com campaign got into, into trouble because it came out that the t-shirts were manufactured by loads of Bengali migrant women um, who were paid them like 60, 60p an hour. Uh, so in order to kind of revoke that, 
they were all made, the desert maps are made up of those images of the women working. Um, yeah, so, yeah, so the use just became a kind of billboard for these images and they were circulated around various social media sites. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you want to talk about tech side of maps? Yeah, so, <clears throat> and this is sort of now going back to what we were originally talking about regarding surveillance. So the technology being used here, um, one of the most uh, obvious ones that people use is called OpenCV, which is like open source piece of software for facial recognition, tracking, and for other objects as well. And for this installation, this is what a feminist looks like. Um, I've made a piece of software which, yeah, is being used. It, it's very good at automatically tracking faces. Um, yeah, OpenCV. And it does this by it, it, a bunch of really smart people have identified lots of different facial features which you use to recognize a person. So you quite often it's able to recognize an eye, and from that it can go, this is the bridge of the nose, this is the mouth, etc. And so, yeah, and this is software that is being used in a variety of places, um, not just for um, government use, but quite, uh, which we'll get onto soon, for advertising as well. So um, if we followed up the This Is What A Feminist Looks Like with uh, one, two of the Paying Artists campaign, uh, they created this mask. That, sorry, that, yeah, that was the East Side Project in the summer. So Antonio used the software as well, so it would automatically attach to the user's face. Yeah, so there was very little intervention that I needed to do in order for this to happen because the software was just built to track faces. But you can kind of see here how it works in the sense that you just have to stand in front of the webcam and then it automatically... Um... And some more outputs of those. Uh... <laughs> um, so what we're looking to do during the fellowship is to kind of... Um, contextualize the mask a little bit um, and we've been thinking about the idea of Skull's Bridal as a kind of a structure on which to uh, create a pattern around and these were kind of uh, medieval torture masks which basically work by uh, stopping the tongue from moving so therefore the person wearing it is not able to speak This is just more development, but it's not quite aesthetically there yet. So, and also during, um, while we've been doing these projects over the last year, the software's got more and more advanced. So more and more of the face has, have to, has had to be covered in order for the mask to work, um, which is kind of, which is a little bit problematic because I was very keen on following kind of, uh, more kind of social scientists in this idea of movements being made through kind of personal connections and communities of interest so the idea of being able to personally know who else is involved is quite important in kind of building relationships yeah and also we want to um so when we collected all these data we want to actually project all these maps instead of just existing online into a public space um and there's been a few occasions, and both it, I mean, in Birmingham, for example, last year, there was public space protection orders put out which haven't, haven't um, gone through. But there's um, a few interventions happening where kind of um, protest or just performance in public spaces is slightly under threat. So we've been thinking about objects which are relevant, which we can then put into these spaces and can act as kind of forms on which to send out political messages. Do you want to talk about that as well? <clears throat> yeah, sure. Um, this is almost now bringing up to where we are currently. So, um, Zach Glass is an artist, uh, studied at Goldsmiths, I think, I can't remember where he's from, but somewhere in America. And one of the pieces that he created this is a weaponizing uh, images. He's weaponizing people's faces. So this was a one uh, to do with, uh, basically, can you spot, does a gay person have a look uh, about themselves? So he scanned the faces of lots of gay people and then combined them into this one mass, which, yeah, it looks like a bunch of blobs, which is a political statement to say that there isn't a certain look about a gay person uh, that you can say from like, oh yeah, the head, the, the, uh, the almost leads back to phrenology, but you know, it's, there's no sort of um, things you can recognize there. Um, we're kind of um, 
particularly interested in looking at maybe photographs or images captured of peaceful protesters or other people who have been documenting for for these things, maybe morphing those into an object which could be 3D printed. And then this is Tony Alza as well, who we're really interested in, who kind of creates these kind of um, monumental god type, if you go into the next one as well, god type um, interventions within public spaces. So these are the kind of lines that we're thinking along. And uh, so where we are right now, and this is where our, our major focus is, um, is the Birmingham media eyes. So very briefly, you might have seen these being developed. And these are actual eyes. They have cameras in them which are using, which are tracking people as they walk by. And what the software is doing with these is taking a guess at your age and gender, and it's collecting that data in order to then you know, advertise stuff to you. So it can say, at four o'clock on a Tuesday, there's more women wearing blue, and then it's Friday at seven, there's more men wearing yellow, or something like that, and serve up ads to um, work with that. And we were interested, well, one we don't like is, it's like 1984, come on. And then um, it's like, well, what, this, this data that's been collected, what actually is being collected about this all? So we started to submit a number of freedom of information, or um, there's another word that I'm looking for, which I forgot, uh, FOI and um, subject access requests. Oh yeah, it's got my address on there, please don't visit my house. But, uh, <laughs> so yeah, we submitted it to find out what actually what data, after a number of months of submitting, don't worry, um, actually I can talk about these another time. But just, I had to take a photo of myself wearing a set piece of clothing, and then said, oh yeah, I'm here at this point in time. Can I have the data back that was collected about me? Lots of back and forth, and eventually what we find out is that the software that they're using apparently anonymizes all of the data. We don't know what data then is being collected. The guess is that it's uh, sort of time stamped and whatever, but still, interesting to know what is being collected and Almost, yes, how I come back to what we're talking about with masks, how can we then avoid this facial detection software using sort of the skull's bridal and these dazzle patterns? Can we subvert this? Can we escape this? Um, yeah, and Lucy also has some research. We have okay, um, so yeah, we both put in FOIs, but um, National Rail have no ownership of those, of those eyes. Um, and Grand Central redirected me to Quiverdy, who kind of said it's all anonymous. Yeah, so these are just emails back and forth. I did email Quiverdy, who are the company who, um, who yeah, who make the software, uh, but they, they haven't got back to me. So um, all of this work is kind of a protest against being, we have to stop. <laughs> It's really quick. Um, so we've just been doing interventions, uh, mainly taken from other protests around surveillance, and we're just looking during the fellowship to contextualise these and put them into a site-specific context of Birmingham and also the use of surveillance as targeted advertising as well. Yeah. yeah, we'll stop there, uh, but we are obviously here later on, so uh, thank you for that. And